Celebrating success, learning from legends, and growing poppies. This is Tall Poppy Talk with Grace Lewis. Welcome everyone. Today we have a gold and bronze medalist, New Zealand's youngest ever athlete to compete at the Games at just 13 years old back in 2012, a multi-sport athlete competing in both swimming and cycling at the highest levels and setting records in both. And she was appointed as a member of the New Zealand Order of Merit in 2017, New Year's Honours for her services to swimming. Nikita Howarth, thank you so much for joining me today on Tall Poppy Talk. How are you? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, I'm great. Um, just, you know, hanging out, training and all that sort of stuff. So it's great to be on here. Thank you. Have you trained this morning or are you training today? I have trained this morning, yes. I'm going to train this afternoon. I've just done gym and I've got swimming this afternoon. Is that a usual day, like a usual Friday? Yeah, it is. Yeah. So normally, actually, normally I have three sessions on a Friday. It would be swim in the morning and then gym straight after and then another swim in the afternoon. Okay. That makes me hungry. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. And for anyone interested, Nikita and I actually go way back and we'll talk about that soon. Talk about your mom and how she... It was fun, but a little scary sometimes in dance, yeah. <laughs> in dance class. <laughs> um, but to kind of give background, I remember like a really pivotal moment when I was like, well, Nikita's really doing things, right? Is we're year nine, so what am I, 13? We're sitting in assembly and our principal's talking about how Nikita's at like, the Paralympic Games. And I'm just sat there. It's like my 13-year-old self, like, wow, she's really... She's out there doing that and we're just kind of chilling. And so I wanted to ask, like, that's how I felt about it was just really impressed. Like, whoa, that's a lot. But from your perspective, what were you like thinking and feeling when you're pretty young and most of your peers like me are just like going about our business, going to school? What did you think and feel during that time? Um, I think mostly I was like, thank God I don't have to go to school. But um <laughs> I mean, it was pretty exciting to fly around the world and compete for New Zealand. I was also, I was so young, so I, I don't think it quite like hit me that I was actually doing that until I, maybe I was like 15 years old. Um, but to me, it just seemed normal because that's, you know, that's what I was doing and that's what, that's where I was at. So, yeah. So it didn't like the magnitude of it when you got to the games, did it feel any different? No, not really. I like, I think for me, Rio was bigger than London. Um, but that's purely because I was so young and like I like I didn't really understand what was going on half the time so sort of away with the fairies a little bit oh man that's I guess that kind of makes sense because you've just been doing it like it's it's not normal for most people to get into it that young and to be so successful how do you think the role of your family contributed to that um I think it was quite good how they stayed pretty casual about it so um, you know, obviously they were excited for me and they wanted to come and watch and stuff like that. And they did. But I think just like bringing, like going back home and like me still having to do chores and like, <laughs> like dishes and like my homework and all that sort of stuff just like brought me back down, you know, like I, like I don't see myself as like, like a high achiever. I just, you know, that sort of just happened. Yeah. And do you think when you came back from that first games back to school and life, was it sort of the same or did you notice a difference? No, it was, it was the same. It was basically, people just looked at me more, I think. Um, but I'm used to that anyway. So, like, I, I guess it was just the same, like, uh, back to reality, you know? Yeah. Well, okay. And in terms of defining yourself, like, I start, I'm hyping you up for obvious reasons, like, very successful sporting. But there's a lot more to you. And like you said, maybe people are now like, oh, hey, she does this thing. We know about it. But how would you have defined yourself if we're not looking at swimming or we're not looking at cycling? What other things do you like to do? Um, that's a good question. So I actually got a go-kart for my 21st birthday. Um, my dad built it. And so like, I love just like going out to the farm and just racing around on that. I'm a very um, homebody. So I like to be with my family a lot. And I like to, like, I like to get dirty, you know, just like go down the farm, help dad with feeding out or, you know, help dad like uh, down at the at the um, shed or come and help mum bake, like, you know, do cooking and stuff like that. Go walks with my sisters. Um, yeah, just family stuff. I love that. The go-kart though. So he built that himself? 
Yeah, yeah, he built it. So it was my 21st birthday present. Um, I kind of knew sort of that it was coming, but like, it's so, it's so sick, honestly. It's got <laughs> gears and everything. Oh, wow. And so I would be scared, honestly, like I think go-karting is sick, but do you just rip it around the farm? Yeah, pretty much. And like, Dave gets annoyed if I like go on the road because then I can go real fast, sort of like 70k an hour. But um, I mean, it's pretty safe. It's got, I've got like, obviously I wear a helmet and I have a roll cage. And I have like four point seatbelt. Um, yeah. So like, it's pretty safe. Yeah. Would that ever be something like you want to take from a hobby? Some, I know, can you compete in, that might be ignorant. Can you compete in go-karting or is it more like BMX stuff? I don't know if it's go-karting. I would say more like, like motorsport, like car racing. Like I would yeah. love that, but I don't think my parents would be stoked if I told them that I wanted to do that. <laughs> okay. So we keep that like a hobby for now and just sneak out on the road when you can maybe. Yeah, I, I sort of got on the road. I think he trusts me a bit more now. Like, I, it's been a while since I've crashed. Like, I've crashed, like, the first week that I had it because, like, you know, I was learning how to drive it and stuff like that. But, like, I haven't crashed in ages, so I think they trust me now. It's something like that, too, learning something. Like, obviously, swimming, you're pretty good and you know what you're doing in that sphere. So was it nice to learn something again? Yeah, yeah, it was nice to, like, be a rookie, you know? <laughs> not knowing what I'm doing yeah oh I, yeah that's that's awesome um and kind of feeding into that like I found it really interesting like I knew you'd made a switch what was it in 2016 after Rio you went to cycling and yeah I would, started cycling in 2018 yeah okay can you explain like a little bit more about that switch because I know I know it was like a little complicated maybe swimming and then cycling and then back to swimming are you comfortable sharing kind of what went around there yeah so um in 2016 like six months before the Paralympics I was heavily depressed and so I thought you know what I'm not gonna compete after Rio so I went to Rio knowing that I was gonna stop and then I went to Rio stopped um took a holiday took like a year off um tried to get back in the pool but couldn't um just kind of bring myself to do it and so I decided that I was going to switch sports and I'd always wanted to be a cyclist like since I was like eight and so I decided that I was like you know what let's give it a go so I tried cycling and I got real good real quick and so I continued on that path for ages and then I found out that I had a skin condition called psoriasis which made it very hard to train and very painful so I decided to stop. Wow and Quickly, was Sarah Alma, I remember you saying she was the inspiration back in the day. Was that like when you were eight and you wanted to cycle? Yeah, yeah. That was like yeah. like a long time ago, yeah. And then my inspirations recently were sort of like, just like all the sprinters that were in Cambridge. So like Eddie Dawkins, Sam Webster and um, the other Sam and stuff like that, yeah. Wow. And do you think knowing, like heading into that the Games 2016, like, I'm going to finish after this. Did you feel a bit of relief almost? Yeah, definitely. It was, I was stoked. Like, you know, yeah. it's, I was so excited to like, just stop swimming, stop waking up so early, just like not exercise my whole life. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, thank you for sharing that. And I wonder from there, obviously getting back into swimming now, like for a bit or whatever, did you feel the expectations had changed for yourself when you decided like I want to get back into it um I think so yeah I think my family was pretty excited about me like getting back into it um and I was pretty excited too but I, like I I had a new thought because the um, classification system had changed so I kind of had a shot at becoming a breaststroker and obviously that happened so um yeah I think I think there was different expectations from me it's just sort of um yeah just sort of like learning a, like a different stroke almost um so there's a lot less pressure it was nice I like that and I actually found a really interesting article this was back from 2019 and you were saying that you were training closer to home closer to your family and you were getting on really well with your coach and I like that you said um you didn't expect to be doing so well so quickly 
but that had given you a lot of confidence. So I found that interesting because obviously you'd been swimming for so long and someone looking in is like, hey, she has to be confident. Like she knows she's good at this, but that that break, so to speak, that you took and you came back just gave you almost like a fresh perspective on it. And I, I really like to read that. Like it made me smile because I'm like, it sounds like you found your joy in the sport again, but you had to take that step away. Yeah, I think, I think definitely the step away was needed, but it was cool that I came back. Um, I like I didn't expect to want to come back but then I was like missing it heaps and so I did um, and then it was like it was great yeah and when you had come back like I I'm rowing so I know like when you sometimes you leave the rowing environment there's certain people there uh, I don't know this coach whatever you come back and maybe a few characters have changed but everyone's still stoked to see you come back like did you find the environment was the same as you'd left or like the people, any of that different? Or was it kind of just like getting straight back into it? Um, it was a little bit different because when I was swimming up in Auckland, like I, like all the people were, you know, from Auckland and half of them have retired now. And um, I'm training with like um, a club. Um, and so there's heaps of school age kids. So ranging from like 12 to 17, 18. And so it's a lot different. Like I came back and I, you know, I had to meet all these new people and I had to train with them. And I didn't really know them. So that was like quite exciting. Like just meeting heaps of new people, having a new coach. That was cool. I bet too, they would have loved having you there, like trying to race you, like just having that different training partner. I can imagine if I was them, I'd be like, yo, I'm training with Nikita. Like that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose. Half of them didn't know who I was at the start though, um, which was nice. It was refreshing. Um, okay. Yeah. Here I am being like, what? But I guess it's, again, it's nice for you to come into that environment and like just do it because you want to do it and find your own rhythm with it. That's cool. That's honestly so sick. Um, and a bit of a subject change, but kind of the genesis of what I'm hoping to achieve with this project, I like to call it, tall poppy syndrome. Like I first would just want to ask, if you're familiar with it, like what you think about this concept of tall poppy syndrome in New Zealand and have you ever felt it or maybe like seen it? Just start with what are you, how would you describe tall poppy syndrome? Um, so, so basically what I've heard is like if someone's really good at something or like really smart, people just tend to cut them down. And I honestly haven't seen a lot of it. And I've definitely not experienced it, which is nice. Obviously it's good um but like you see it um uh, well think like, that she had tall poppy syndrome so people were just cutting her down left right and center even though she was an amazing athlete like she was so good at what she did like it's just so sad to see that happen to such an extent you know you you say oh yeah you know this person's good at this but people were actually telling her stuff like that you know like you need to be better you're not good enough um, and I just like, I just think it's so horrible, but I yeah. personally never experienced that, which is quite good. And I, yeah, I wish no one could experience that, but so many people have. Yeah. That's, thank you for sharing that. I know that that's, that's a lot. It's very upsetting. And that's part of why I want to talk about it because very successful doing amazing things. And sometimes it's with anything with mental health. If, and like you said, you shared your struggles with it we're in our own heads and if people are contributing to that and it might be a passing moment for them they don't realize how much that's sticking to us and like how much that's hitting when someone's working so hard for something and I as serious and as like frightening as it is I'm trying to make us like switch the narrative in society so instead of seeing you know like you said wanting to maybe chop down people who are doing really well it's like hey let's actually listen and learn and kind of respect what they're doing and that's why I really loved when you said people that had inspired you like even as you'd gone on in your swimming career you're still getting inspired from cyclists etc so I wanted to ask and you kind of already answered it instead of maybe chopping them down it's like who do you look up to when you're looking at successful people because I consider you on and I'm looking at everything you're doing but to hear maybe hear how you're thinking about it it's really I think important to be like everyone's always kind of striving and looking up to someone else so if we can share 
experiences so like you even just sharing your experience I think hopefully will open people's eyes like oh wow like I think it's all you know roses and daisies and sunshine for Nikita but she's actually had to go through struggles to get there and fortunately you feel like you haven't suffered from comments from other people and I think that that's from a lot of reasons maybe your family the community you were brought up in whatever it is but I don't think anyone should have to ever experience that so I like to kind of twist it onto like a positive note now it's like okay what would you like what would you like to see I guess instead of people like bringing others down if you see someone successful how would you like us to kind of approach that and I know that's like a weird kind of big (laughs) question but what do you think about that I think honestly so this is basically I'm a, I'm a real straight up person so what I've been doing like with my life recently is just being real honest so if I see someone just like killing it in life like just doing an absolute awesome job I go up to them and I just tell them because I feel like they need to know or well, if I think someone's absolutely stunning and they have great muscles I will tell them like I yeah. just think that people should talk to them more often like you know you're so cute or wow you're so good at that like you should keep doing that you're so good at it you know I just I love feel that. like honesty. Yeah. It's like when you see someone, you know, wearing like a really beautiful jacket or something, even if it's just like aesthetic, being like, I love that jacket on you. And you see their smile yeah. like when they brighten up. And even at the start, before we started recording, when I'm like, oh, thank you so much for getting on. Like I could see your smile. And that makes me feel good. And it makes you feel good. So I, I love that just being straight up and being like, yeah you don't you can start small like we can people don't have to be like I admire everything you you do like yeah. I'd want to do <laughs> yeah. but just, just like start small like hey that looks really good or like keep crushing it that's yeah also super easy like people can do that oh, all the absolutely. Time. yeah even if someone say someone's doing like their job and yeah they're doing it they're just doing their job but like it, like that's they're doing a great job you know like wow you're doing such a good job thank you like you know, just like appreciating the fact that they're helping you doing something. Like, yeah, it's not that hard to compliment someone, you know? <laughs> oh, I, I love that. I, that actually has me smiling, just like thinking about doing that to people. I'll start doing that. Um, and I have to ask, I know we're going back a little bit, but when you were appointed, like into the New Zealand, the New Zealand Order of Merit, what were your thoughts going through that? Like, that has to be a moment where you're like, oh, wow, I've, I've officially done something really, really cool and successful. Yeah, um, I think for me, I almost thought that like I hadn't done enough to receive it, but I mean, clearly I had, but like you, like you sort of feel proud, like, whoa, like the things that I've done have like have allowed me to get this medal, like what the heck, you know, like I didn't think it was that special, but like apparently it is. So, you know, that's pretty cool. That that is so cool, and um, I wonder too. Like when that happens, how did you find out? Like I haven't obviously got one. So do they send you an email? Do they call you? Like how does that happen? Um, usually they send you an, a congratulatory email, um, and then they'll you know they'll um, call you and sort of tell you, you know, um, how your how everything's going to run on the day and stuff like that, where you're going to go. Um, and then when you get to the ceremony, it's just like, like everyone's dressed so fancy and you almost feel like you're, you know, at, at the, uh, like the queen and the queen's presence or something, you know, like it's crazy. Yeah. Rest in peace, the queen, but you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, it, it's literally that level though. Like that's yeah, it's, I, it's scary. I can imagine. I, I also want to ask, I'm going to keep n- pressing now when you got, gold right like back in 2016 and I think there's like there's a couple priceless photos when obviously for swimmers you have to like touch the wall and then look up right is that what you do you like look up to see on a screen or what is that moment at the last what like last like 10 meters of a race to when you see look up and see the splits like what's that whole experience um well, for me in 2016, I was quite a way ahead. And so from the 150 meter, I knew that I had won it basically. Um, and so I, like, I was just like smiling under the water almost like trying not to suffocate. Cause I was like so excited. And then I touched the wall and I was like, 
it's like almost a, like a sigh of relief like oh thank god you know like I want a medal all my hard work is worth something um yeah, yeah that's what I that's unusual right well is it unusual to be that far ahead at that point like to have it's the confidence unusual. yeah 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 and, and then I decided to win by a lot so <laughs> yeah there's some, the photos of you I, I honestly love it when you're looking up at the screen and you're like that's got it and you're probably hurting but you're not remembering the pain oh, yeah, definitely I was probably crying <laughs> crying inside is there um like when it comes to racing is there a pre or post ritual you do can you tell me the secret um I don't really think so I think I just kind of try to relax a little bit like I try and intimidate my competitors I guess um <laughs> you know stand up, dance around in front of them start singing you know stuff like that but um well because I'm taller than most of them yeah genuinely taller it it gives them quite a fright you know like like when I was in um Portugal for the world champs I, w I stood up and like started dancing around and I just saw one of my competitors just like and sink into her seat and I was like whoops <laughs> but um yeah <laughs> oh sort of wow that. yeah that's cool I didn't even I didn't even imagine because with Ryan that's what I keep comparing to we'll do that at the start like you're sitting up at the start and you're kind of you'll look and you'll try to size yourself up against the other person but we're like meters away but before a race I guess because you all walk up to the starting blocks you can just be within each other's business yeah definitely um like you try not to interact with them once you're like called out onto the like onto the pool deck but like when you're in marshalling like you can talk to them and stuff like that I don't I don't really talk to them because you know that you don't really want to talk to your competitors but um if you beat them it's fine you know if you are afterwards. <laughs> yeah what happens afterwards like once you get out get out of the pool do you have to do stretching cool down do you just want to yeah, celebrate like yeah you you have to get out obviously like sometimes you get drug tested so you get out immediately people are like hovering around you like are you Nikita yes I am okay we're here from drug testing okay are you good um but usually it's like warm down and then like go and see or go and see my coach and then go warm down and just call my parents or whatever is that the best part for you after the race like is it talking to your coach is it calling your parents like who do you normally want to share the moment with um honestly like everyone basically like I'll just I pick up my phone and it's just full with messages or something but the really great part after racing is how much food you get to eat if I'm being honest <laughs> what so is hungry, constantly what, yeah what is your go-to oh uh, anything everything and anything <laughs> pizza pasta like literally anything seaweed seaweed sushi are you yeah. more savory more savory than sweet oh no you've got to go you've got to go both but you've got to go savory first and then you've got to go sweet you like need to like yeah you know oh or ice cream. Yeah. do you know i'll tell you what i miss is for anyone listening um because i'm in the u.s i miss hokey pokey ice cream that's the sweet thing i miss because they don't have it here and savory i just miss like a pie like a good old oh, fashioned yeah. beefy yeah. pie. Yeah. Yeah, pies are pies are good stuff, aren't they? Far out. I haven't had a pie in so long. Yeah, We're both gonna want a pie. Do, yeah, it's weird how they don't do um mince pies, like like everything sweet pies, you know, over there. Like yeah. they would drive me insane. <laughs> well, this is actually I've been trying to think of like at the end of, you know, each interview, what do I want to wrap up on, right? Like some signature move. Firstly, before that, is there anything else you kind of wanted to share or do you feel like pretty sweet? I think I'm I think I'm pretty good. Shared quite a lot today. <laughs> right. And I in all seriousness, like I really do appreciate it and really opened up. And that's the goal of it is to just kind of hopefully share with others and like, hey, you're not alone. Let's actually spread that love. I love what you said about let's just be nice and kind to people and tell them when we like something about them or what they're doing it's super easy we can yeah. all do that um and then what I think I'm going to end on to take it back to super superficial level mm. if you had to eat just one meal for the rest of your days what would it be 
probably like probably like a like a beef burrito bowl with dumplings on the side. Oh, that's crossing two different cuisines. That's cheating. What? I know. <laughs> <laughs> probably yeah probably beef burrito bowl <laughs> with dumplings on the side oh uh, yeah that's actually so awesome Nikita thank you so so much I can't stress how great it is just to catch up um see all your successes love it hype it up I'll do it to you right now I admire everything you do and the fact that you're so honest and you share with others you just want to lift people up so thank you very much for being on tall poppy talk today and you're welcome That's back anytime. Right. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to Tall Poppy Talk. We'll see you next time. Feel free to check us out on socials, YouTube, and the website. Thanks for today's guest, and we'll see you all next time. Take care. Be kind.